busy now. As, as you all know, that can be fun sometimes. So uh, trying to switch it over to the, the laptop or the computer here in the room. Uh, they will be with you in just a minute. All right, sorry for the technology issues. Uh, a couple of things. I think this one's not on. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. A uh, couple of things uh, to get started, uh, just to introduce uh, ourselves. Uh, my name is Brian Warnick. I'm an associate professor of agricultural education in the School of Applied Sciences, Technology, and Education in the College of Agriculture and Applied Sciences. That's a mouthful. Uh, I'm an ag ed professor. I'm a teacher educator. That's my, my primary role. And uh, this is Michael Torrens. Michael is the director of the Office of Analysis Assessment and Accreditation and uh, the guru of the IDEA uh, evaluation system. And uh, I think Michael kind of threw me under the bus on this uh, presentation. And uh, that's why I'm here today. That's uh, fair. Uh, and, but, but, you know, John Louis A. threw me under the bus. That's so right. I, I did so, drag somebody in with me. So. So uh, anyway, a uh, couple of things, and, and I, I do not pretend to be an expert with this IDEA system at all. A little bit of background, I, I was uh, in the pilot test group, I think it was 2008, summer of 2008, uh, piloted the uh, IDEA assessment uh, with, my, with a, a general education life science course that I teach. So in addition to preparing teachers, I also teach uh, a gen ed course just for fun, uh, the auditorium style, uh, general education, biology 101, essentially. And uh, I pilot tested it, and I hated it, okay? And then it happened, it was implemented, and I didn't like it at all. And I was frustrated with the objectives, and things were coming, information was coming back, and I couldn't interpret it. The other one was straightforward. I had a system in my promotion of tenure documentation that I could just plug in that USU system, and it, it was nice and clean and clear cut. And now here's this thing with graphs and numbers that didn't make a whole lot of sense. And I would put one number on, and someone would say, that's not the right number to use. And I would put a different number on, and that's not the right number to use. And so for me, it was frustrating to implement this idea system. Over the past couple of years, though, I've seen how it can help provide some feedback for me and for other teachers, other, other instructors uh, that I serve on their committees. And so hopefully I can share some things with you today that I've learned over the past couple of years. Uh, and then Michael will correct anything which might be a lot, of things that I'm doing incorrectly that, that should be done differently. Some of this he's, he's uh, seen and uh, others he hasn't. So our, what we were tasked with today is to help share some ideas related to developing course objectives that are aligned with the idea objectives and how to select those idea objectives. If there's, and, and the presentation part of this is going to be very short. We're hoping for questions and interaction uh, here uh, in a few minutes. And so if, if that's not the direction of, of things that you're looking for, we have some other things as well. So uh, that, and Michael is, has a whole bunch of things loaded in here to, to share with you. Uh, so for me, whether I'm planning a new course or I'm taking an old one and looking at how this fits with the idea, I think the most important thing is to use the Stephen Covey phrase, begin with the end in mind. I think, I think it's important. Where are we headed with this course? What, what is it that I want my students to know or do as a result of them being in my class? I think that's the first question that we need to ask when it comes to this. And uh, one of the things, and, and this came from initially uh, a, a couple of researchers in education, Wiggins and McTie, they, uh, they shared this, uh, this idea of enduring understanding. What is it in instruction? Because I can share a whole bunch of things, if I, whether it's my life science class or a teaching methods course that I'm teaching or any of the courses that you teach. There's a large number of things, concepts, skills that we can share with our students. But it's important to focus in on what's the most important. I like this idea of, under, of enduring understanding. What is it a year from now, five years from now, 30 years from now, after a student has taken your course, what is it that you want them to know or be able to do that far out? And I think it's important that we think 
about that enduring understanding. What is it about our instruction that will last? Because frankly, knowing what happens with the spindle fibers in one of the phases of mitosis is probably not going to endure, is it? Unless they become a cell biologist. And someone taking USU 1350 is probably not going to become a cell biologist. Okay? So think about those. What is it down the road that, that we want to last? When a student is asked to summarize what they got from your class, what do you want them to say? What will you teach that you want to last? Okay? Now, we've got the pyramids here. I, just in the last couple of hours, I started with this analogy. It's not perfect, okay? but we're going we're gonna to go with this pyramid theme here for a few minutes. So when I'm sitting down to, to plan a course, and I, I met with a, a, a new instructor a few weeks ago and uh, talked with her about how, how do I plan this, how do I structure this, especially related to these idea objectives, start with those two or three major concepts, skills, uh, those big ideas that serve as that umbrella for the rest of the course. What are those things, that enduring understanding? What are those big picture things? Instead of looking at units, individual, I'm going to teach this and then this, followed by this and this, what are those big ideas, those big picture kinds of things? And then those big ideas, again, will serve as that umbrella. Now, the next thing that I would do in the process, before I get to what activities I'm going to do or what specific objectives or what specific units of instruction or how I'm going to assess or anything else, I'm going to look at those idea center objectives. And I know just seeing, for some of you, seeing that logo probably caused a sinking feeling in your stomach or caused you to break out in, in hives. But uh, take a look at those. And I think you'll find that if you're looking big picture and big ideas, you'll see where they line up. There are only 12 of them. They're pretty broad. If you look at all 12 of them, they're great. It would be wonderful for every course, for every student in every course to come out with the ability to, to do everything that's on that list. But what are those big things? What are the two or three things, and that's a key thing that we'll get to, what are the two or three things uh, that come out of that? What I, kind of the analogy here that I came up with, the idea of those big, the, the big ideas aligned with the idea center we're going to have some alignment tools here, right? We're going to start putting some bricks together and use the idea center objectives as, a, as an assessment tool to see where we're at. Are those bricks being put down in a nice line? Are we level with those? What will those students be able to get as a result of this? And then those individual bricks are those individual objectives the, individual, the very specific course objectives that you will write for your class. What is it that you'll assess on, essentially? Assess those students. So the big ideas, serving as the umbrella, aligned with the idea objectives, and then we start with the, with the building materials. And that teaching process, putting those bricks in place, brick by brick, whatever the sequence of instruction that you're going to use, Whatever concepts that you're going to use to build one on another uh, to get those students to the end of this. Your assessment, again, you're checking how are they aligned with those big picture ideas, how are they aligned with the idea center objectives. Put that string, put that level in place and check each assessment that you do with your students following that process. I think if we use that as kind of the, the conceptual model for this, I think we will build some enduring understanding, and I think, I think that's where those 12 objectives are coming from, are, are those, that idea of uh, enduring understanding. Now, let's take a look at those 12, 12 objectives. I actually got on the AAA website, and I found a different structure with these objectives. Usually, we see them in a list. We get that the FIF, what does it stand for? Faculty Information Form. Faculty Information Form. The FIF, we get that, and we just see this list of 12 objectives. Which do I pick? I found them on the AAA website, and, and I'm sure Michael has shared this with us before, and I ignored it. Uh, but I found them grouped into almost like a, for those of you who are familiar with this, a Bloom's Taxonomy or a Levels of, of Understanding 
Uh, and uh, kind of a cool thing. The first two, objectives one, and they're not in numerical order, by the way. Objectives one and two from the idea objectives are in this basic cognitive, this idea of memorizing and remembering. I'm going to present it. The students will study it. They will learn it. They will memorize it. They'll spit it back out on the test. And uh, for most of you in a biology 101 experience, maybe that was your experience. I don't know. But uh, you know, we can take a look at those gaining factual knowledge, learning fundamental principles. Now, is there anything wrong with those two? In some cases, we have to have this, especially in introductory courses, we have to have that fundamental knowledge before we can build some of the other concepts. If that's, if that's the situation with your class, if, if that's the enduring understanding, if I'm, and I'm going to, I don't think he's in the room, I'm going to pick on him. If I'm Andy Anderson and I'm teaching anatomy and physiology, there's going to be a lot of this, labeling, terminology, those, those sorts of things. Uh, that, that are part of that fundamental understanding. And so that might be uh, one of his objectives. I don't know. I can't speak for him. The second group of these, objectives three and four, are the applications. So now we're moving from memorizing concepts or memorizing facts and terminology to actually applying those in different situations. Uh, and the, the thing that dawned on me this, this last spring, if you take a look at number three, learning to apply course materials, and then there's this parentheses. Well, when I actually put the, the idea objective, and I'll show you this in a little bit, in my course syllabus, I took the parentheses out and I put what it was applied to. I changed the wording mm -hmm. of those idea objectives. I used them, but I made them fit my class. Instead of saying, here's the course description, here are the idea objectives. Now, here are my course objectives. I said, here's the course description. Here are the goals for the course. I used these idea objectives as a framework and changed the wording to, to match with my course and then followed with those specific objectives. So I'll show you those in a minute. And then number four, developing specific skills, competencies. I've taught skill-based courses. I've taught welding. I've taught computer applications. Certainly those would... Those would fit right there. Uh, expressiveness, the, the more creative kinds of classes, the writing, uh, the theater, the music, but also uh, some, there are a lot of others that might fit under this expressive where students are creating. And uh, anyway, you can see those six and eight fit under there. Intellectual development, uh, pushing students to a, a little bit more critical thinking level with these, a broader understanding and appreciation uh, and for me, in this USU 1350 class, more important than memorizing specific concepts from that class or processes, to me, it's a, it's a course for non-majors. I need them to have a broader understanding and appreciation of science, of life sciences. And so that's, I've, 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 that's one, of the, one of the objectives that I've selected, but I've changed the wording of it to match my course, to be more specific. Um, and also this learning to analyze and critically evaluate. To me, that's, a, it's, that's an important part, to be able to, to be literate about science and, and speak with those. Lifelong learning, these are, these are great. And again, they would fit with every course. But unless this is a primary component of your course, I probably wouldn't select them. If this is the goal of your course, one of those big ideas, one of those two or three big ideas, then certainly choose them. And again, they're wonderful things, but don't include them if they're not uh, the primary focus of your class, if that makes sense. And then the last one, again, a wonderful thing that we want all of our students to develop, but if it's not one of the primary uh, focuses of your class, I wouldn't include it. Acquiring skills and working with others as a member of a team. Now, if that's the whole goal, if it's a seminar course or, or something where they work together as a team, I think it's wonderful. Uh, some, as far as selection of the objectives, uh, my general rule of thumb, and if you, if you go to Michael's website, it'll say three to five. I start with three. Uh, and, and really, if, if you only have one big idea, it's okay to have one, isn't it? I almost have never seen a class where it only does one thing. But it's possible. It's possible. I think if you selected one objective, your department head might sit down and say, really? Yeah. But, and if you can defend it, you know. 
we do we did do tools for all the department heads so they can see how many objectives people are choosing and that kind of thing. So okay. yeah, no, I mean it's it's possible would be unusual. Okay. Some may have five. Don't do twelve. Don't pick all twelve. It'll mess you up. It'll mess up your evaluation and and it'll be hard for you to keep aligning that level, that, that string with, with everything. So leave those others blank. As far as essential versus important, I think the, the big key is to know that essential is counted double. It's a double-weighted objective. Uh, so if your students see, the, if, if, if you're not hitting that in the student's eyes, and remember all of this is student perception, if you're not meeting that objective according to your students, it will count double against you. Now, if you are meeting it, it counts double for you. So make sure, if it really is essential, in that formula, to get those numbers, it, it's a double counter. Anything you mark it as essential is a double counter. Now, for me, in, my, in that gen ed life science course, I don't have an essential one. I have three that are important. I have none that are essential. Is that okay? That's fine, and, and the number is, is actually, if you picked them all as essential, you get the same outcome as if you picked them all True. as important. Yes, please. So does it say on the IDEA website when you go in to do this that you don't have to have an essential one, A and B, that it counts double if you pick an essential one? It is it, not? Yeah, it is on our frequently asked questions page for faculty, and that's what he was talking about. That's where he drew the, the Bloom's modified taxonomy from. So I can point you to that. and. There we also have sort of step-by-step -step instructions for how to fill out the faculty information form with screenshots and all that kind of thing. So as part of my piece of this, I'll show you all that spot. The idea thing itself describes at the top that you can pick important or essential, and I believe it does say that it's double-weighted on the faculty information form, but a lot of times when you actually get there, you know, you're kind of going through, I need to check my bubbles off and, and get it submitted so I can move on to my work. Um, well, I mean, you can't print the thing off after you selected it, so you, you're like, what did I just do, you know? If you think and you do it at the time, but that's the frustration I have with it. Yeah, and, and, and the other thing you should all know is that every department has a departmental staff that's been trained in the IDEA administrative system, and those people have access to a back-end administrative system where they go in and they look at the courses and make sure that all the right courses are being evaluated and they can add courses or take courses out. But they also have, they also have your completed faculty information form all the way up until the point when it gets submitted. So if you ever needed to get a copy of it, you could actually get them to go in and, and print you out a copy from your faculty information form. And I don't necessarily know that that's commonly known. A lot of the communication that my office does is directly with the department heads and the departmental staff. So there's a little bit of dependency upon you know, the ability of those departments to communicate effectively with their faculty. But I'm telling you now that if you need to get a copy of that, you can get it from departmental staff. And if you need to know who that person is in your department, email me, call me, I'll tell you. Well, or you can just email it to us as soon as we submit it. So that then we would well, see, the other thing you have to understand is I don't run IDEA. We've contracted with a, this nonprofit in Kansas that runs IDEA. They're the folks that send the emails out. They're the ones that design the online system. So all the kind of complaints about the mechanics about the way it works is something that's completely outside of my control. I don't get an email when you fill it out, and it's a good thing because we load 3,500 classes every semester. If we had to manage those classes individually as opposed to relying on the departments, it would be completely unmanageable for my office. Go ahead. Does the teaching delivery method change the weighting at all? And how about where it asks how much reading do students have to do, how much memorization do they have to do? Do those factors play into the weighting at all? Nope, not at all. Yeah, there are only two questions that are on that, that the students respond to on the short form, which is mostly what everybody's using. Most people aren't using the diagnostic. That the, there's a longer form that has 43 questions. The short form has 18 questions. There are two questions, one that asks about work habits and one that asks about student motivation. You know, how much do you work relative to other students? You know, that, that kind of thing. Those impact the adjusted scores. Everything else has no impact on, on the weighting of the scores. One more if I could. How do you keep faculty from reverse engineering this? I can go back and read my idea evaluations from my students for the last eight semesters, and they say he's teaching me a lot of facts and memorization, but I'm not learning to think critically. So if I don't think critically as one of my objectives and I make facts and memorization the one that's double-weighted, suddenly all my evaluations look much better. 
So I've had this question before, you know, what happens with faculty who are going to game the system or whatever. From my perspective, you can't game the system in the sense that as long as you're effectively communicating with your students what your learning objectives are, and the key thing there is you, I think you really do have to map for your students between the idea language and what you have as the activities and assessments and, and course objectives, because they're not going to intuit necessarily the general language. You know, you said you kind of customize the language, right? But I think you actually have to map that either in the syllabus or verbally or whatever. But take that as an assumption that that communication happens effectively, right? So your students are actually saying, this is how much I learned in these areas. So your student is saying, I learned a lot in this area of knowledge. I learned less in this area of critical thinking. That's an accurate representation of what the students learned in your class. The question about whether you have the right objectives for that level class, for that piece of it, has to do with your relationship with the program objectives of whatever program you're working for, your department head, your, you know, your, your department. So that process of making sure that the courses that are supposed to be teaching specific things are teaching those right things, that's at the level of assessment of the department and the level of assessment of departmental programs. So if you're getting accurate information from the students, you know, if, if you're teaching a 5,000 level class and you have in, we do basic knowledge or whatever, your department head has the tools to go in and look and say, those building blocks, you know, are not building to what we want to have. We, that's why we have these 1,000, 2,000, you know, maybe 3,000 level classes that are teaching essential comments. We really expect to see different objectives and your students are not getting that. Right? So it assumes an entirety of an assessment system that works effectively. So from my perspective, you can't game the system. Now, we may, not imp we may be in a process of implementing kind of assessments at the program level and that kind of thing. So it may not be coming down yet to you where you have a department head saying, I'd like to talk with you about the objectives that you have for your class. But we've certainly built the tools to make that happen. So that may not be a, you know, a very, that may sound kind of threatening, but it's, it's sort of, you should pick the right objectives for your class. If you don't do that, your responsibility is to your department head. Your responsibility is to your students. Yes, Chuck. Oh, as a department head, uh, I think you said that well, and I look at that, and also I agree you're not gaining the system because if, uh, uh, you, you know, it becomes evident to me if you uh, are getting greater than these and they're not, uh, uh, the idea objectives and they're not appropriate for the course level and I'm seeing there's a real disconnect between that you know uh, I'm gonna you know bring that to your attention and say that you know this course needs to be restructured and and, uh, and, and look at these objectives so you know we want to pick I mean to me if like to get accurate information if you picked them I'm getting accurate information and a good reflection of the course that's telling me what it's about so by doing what you're just saying, it's not gaming the system, it's actually giving me the information I need to make the decisions you've just said. That, that's and my perspective. That, that's a better way of putting it, even. You yeah. know, it's giving me the right information, and it's giving you that on a, on a programmatic basis. Good. Another question in the back. So um, I'm just going to jump right because I think this is a it's a chance for me to make a shameless plug for our uh, website and uh, I don't I, I get the sense that a lot of people don't necessarily know that that we've got this up here so um, um, oh that's right is it all caps there we go it's trying to give me free gas. Um, if you go to our website, which is usu.edu forward slash AAA, lowercase a, um, and you go to assessment and you go to course evaluations, um, we have, first of all, the way you can get any of your evaluation results. You log in with your A number, and then there's just an open text search, and you can search for any of the details, right? But we also have on this page um, a faculty frequently asked questions. And so on this page at the bottom, we have models of the forms. Now, these are... Rather than taking screen sh trying to take screenshots, we actually took the paper forms, but the language is exactly the same. You can click on the rating short form and see what your students see. This is the text that they get 
electronically when they get an email from the idea system, right? So they're saying 12 possible learning objectives are listed below, not all of which will be relevant in this class. Describe the amount of progress you made on each, even those not pursued in this class using the following scale. And then they're being asked, no apparent progress, slight progress, I made small gains, moderate progress, I made some gains, substantial progress, I made large gains, exceptional progress, I made outstanding gains. So that's actually what they're reporting on. And then on the, um, I don't think I have this in. Oh, I do. Yeah, it's there. Um, and then on the results side, right, you get back, you get back a form that looks like this, right? Here's your, your multiple pages of results. At the back of it is this thing called statistical detail, and I always go to that when I sit down and talk with a faculty member or department head. I'm always looking at the statistical detail because it shows the actual answers from all of your individual students. So here you have the frequency table. So actually, how many students put down one? How many put down two? How many put down three and four and five, right? You have the any omitted. So sometimes people have a feeling like, you know, I had a student who just filled in all ones, or I think we had these students that skipped, you know, questions or whatever. You, you, you'll, you would be able to see that. If there was a bimodal distribution, if you were worried about, kind of worried about self-selection bias among the students, you might see a lot of numbers here under 1, 2, and a lot under 4, 5, right? There was an agreement. You have the average of, of what the students, uh, the average of all the student responses, and then you have the standard deviation, which for non-statistics people, it's just how much agreement was there among the students, right? A smaller number means the students really agreed. They concentrated their answers. They all said, that's a four, right? That's, that's a, or that was exceptional progress. You know, everybody kind of agreed there. Or if it's a larger number, you get into these 0.15, right? That, that shows you had a big number here under 18, but then you had a spread out in these other ones, right? So that means there was less agreement among the students. So you have that as a starting point to kind of understand the, the interpretation that happens up here, right? When you're looking and you see your knowledge here, this kind of goes back to your question. You always have the statistical detail. I could go in and say, where, where do I have the highest numbers, right? But that's where students said they learned. Those are the areas that students said they learned. So if you've communicated effectively, it's an accurate representation of what your class achieved with those students in terms of their perception of it. Right? Um, one key thing to keep in mind is when you're looking at these numbers, your ultimate score, when you go back here and you look and you see uh, a 50 is the median, and then so scores between 45 and 55 are here, it, which make you similar to to, to all the classes evaluated uh, using IDEA, your, your sort of national peer group. Um, that number is based on the difference between this number, the average score provided by the students, and the score for that specific objective of the comparison group. And you'll notice that the comparison group averages are not all the same. They're not all 4.1. Some of these numbers are lower and some are higher. It's the absolute difference between this number and this number that gives you your 50 or 53 or 55 or 60 score. So, you know, this one is 0.4 higher, so that's why it's a 58, okay? Um, if it was, if you had a 4.4 and you were being compared to this 3.7, like if these were higher, you would actually have a higher score than 58 because the difference is 0.6 instead of 0.4. I don't want to get too much into the math, but that's, yeah, go ahead. You're being compared objective by objective. So it's only, it, the comparison is not at the level of the course. The comparison is at the level of the specific objective. And the weighting only impacts it at the level of your local course. In other words, this difference, if that difference is high and you chose it as essential, it's basically doubled. The impact of that higher score is doubled. If you chose it as important, it only counts in once. 
So the, the comparison isn't to a national database just class by class. It's at the objective level. So somebody who chose different objectives, it, they, wouldn't, it, they wouldn't be included in the pool that you're being compared to. Do you follow me? Correct. Well, in the national database, if you're comparing to the Nash, the IDEA national database, or only to classes taught in your discipline, if you choose discipline as the comparison group. You see how there are multiple columns here? The discipline column has a little bit higher numbers, right? This class was taught in, let's see if it says it should, accounting. So in business, in accounting, a, the average score for accounting classes was slightly higher than the score for the database as a whole. And if people want me to get into talking about the actual interpretation of the results, I have a whole PowerPoint about that. I can make it much more clear probably than it might be, but I don't want to hijack. Um, yes? I hope this isn't kicking off so much attention, but I did want to ask a quick question. Um, I found a lot of useful things about this form of evaluation versus what we used to use. The thing that is a real downfall for me is that I teach for a program that's kind of unique and that it's a graduate program where students go through together as a cohort and take all their classes together. And we have near 100% attendance at every class. And so the best way to get 100% response rate on evaluations is when we did the old paper evaluations because they came to the class. Every year I had 100% response rate, every student in the class. Since we've gone to this, we only get about 50, 55% response rate. Is there a way for me to ensure that I can get 100%? You could do it in class. Do it in class, where they would have to bring their computers or... Yep. Mine's a distance ed class where I broadcast a 14 site, so I couldn't take him to a lab, but... But you could have them... You all had some you, ideas about So there, I have a bunch of ideas about things to do in terms of response rates, right? So the, the best peer-reviewed research suggests that... So, First of all, let me acknowledge the, the challenge, which is across the board nationally, online administration of, of, of course evaluations generally has a lower response rate than paper evaluations. And it's somewhat, it depends on exactly whether it's a class where most of the people are attending and there are a lot of details in that, but that's just a reality. Um, there are institutions that have been very successful in having high response rates. Average for the entire institution, 70, 80 percent. BYU gets a big, huge response rate. But, but there's been a fair amount of peer-reviewed research done, and the best research really suggests that there are a couple of factors that are kind of important. And the most, one of the most important factors, well, the most important factor is, is it meaningful for the students, right? And that's a challenging thing to achieve if you don't have a school where there's a very strong kind of culture where the, the expectation at the level of the, in, the students know that evaluations are key to that. I sort of look among the, the colleges here at USU, and some of the best response rates we get are in the College of Education. And it may be because that's a part of kind of the culture of understanding what evaluations are about and having that be part of the expectations, right? But so, so that's the first thing is can you create a culture that's like that? And it, I think you get spirals up and spirals down. So if you have people who say bad things about the evaluation and it's crap and, you know, whatever, then you tend to create a culture where people are like, well, you know, why, why are you wasting my time? So if we put that to the side and sort of say we're trying to create a culture where students value it, which means faculty have to value it, which means administration has to value it, has to be a consistent message, if we put that aside, you know, we want to achieve that, but it's a long-term goal. The second most important thing that the peer-reviewed research shows is is it, do the students see it as part of the class? Or is it something that's bolted on? Is it some extra favor that you're asking, right? That, that's, that's kind of apart from the work of the class. And when that happens, you get lower response rates because students are like, it's gotta take time and I have these other things or whatever. So the things that you can do to make it feel like a part of the class are put it in the syllabus as an actual assignment with a time and a date, right? Put it in Canvas. Give it, you know, make it an assignment in Canvas, and if you don't believe in, in, you know, doing credit points for it, just do it with no points. But just an assignment, sort of, it says it's slotted in, and then you can talk about it. We always send out an email the week before the evaluations open and say, you know, the evaluations are going to open up. If you have schedules that are a little different than the regular semester, we could work something out to kind of give a reminder. But 
you know, say to them, it's really important that you do the evaluation. It's an essential part of the class because I use it in these ways, right? So that's one way to, to try to increase response rates without even talking about incentive systems or, or you know, any other ways. So that's my kind of thinking about that. Hey. Yeah. Is right. You said the, the scores that are there in those uh, three columns on the right uh, for the comparison groups, that is the uh, mean or average score uh, for the courses in the idea or the courses in the discipline or the institution, but only for those courses amongst that group that have chosen that objective as important or essential. That's correct. And that goes down through all of them, and, and that's for the whole whole list. Whether or not you chose it, uh, that was the, uh, that's the, the average value. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. A few um, moments ago, you said that there were a couple of questions that do affect the um, analysis of the data, yeah. and you, you used the word motivation. I think that's question number 15. I really wanted to take this course regardless of who taught it. That looks like the motivation question. So my question is, um, my, well, my understanding is, is that a student may rate the teacher very high or the course is excellent or very high, a five on any of the progress questions. But I've heard that if they rated uh, number 15 very high, such as a five, I really wanted to take this course, then whatever high ratings they put on some of these other answers were actually scored lower. Is that correct? So, and if so, why is my punish for a student who really wanted to take this course and rated it highly, that their voice doesn't count as much, or their rate, high rating doesn't count as as a student who didn't want to take this course, but then rated it very highly. So let me actually go in here and, and explain how the, um, how the adjustments work, because I think that's a helpful thing to do. Um, and it's, I was saying um, before we started the presentation that my, my biggest issue that I have with um, IDEA is it has a lot of complexity. And I think it's easy to be, you know, they sent me to a three-day, all-day training, which is the only reason I'm the guru about IDEA, right? You spend all your time eating and sleeping. Um, it's a lot to digest, especially compared to the old system. You know, you've got raw, you've got adjusted, you've got multiple pages, and things are interacting. There's, you know, so let me just take specifically the question of average scores versus converted. Uh, no, sorry. Um, adjusted scores. There we go. So let me do that. Okay. So what happens, um, basically, you have those two questions on the short form that get to student motivation and that get to work habits. And you also have class size. And so the, the backstory of this is IDEA started out as a homebrewed thing at the University of Kansas that a bunch of uh, academic researchers put together who were involved in education and assessment, right? They liked it so much, other people liked it, wanted to copy it, they spun it off into a separate nonprofit. But their background is really kind of a, a, a research academics background. So one of the concerns that is often raised about course evaluations is there are aspects of each course that you as a faculty member don't have control over. Right? So you don't have control over the class size a lot of times. It's gonna, the class size is going to be what the size is. You're teaching a 200-person introductory class for non-majors. That's not the same as teaching a 20-person graduate class for majors. And that the feeling was that there are aspects of those circumstances that you don't have control over as a faculty member that actually impact the score you get from the students in that class. And so IDEA went out and did, once they had a database of thousands, tens of thousands of classes and responses, they went and did a statistical analysis and said, is it true that large classes get lower scores than small classes? And the answer is yes. Is it true that classes where you have, you know, if you think about students as kind of, uh, you have this bag of students like a bunch of marbles and you draw out of that bag a group that's going to be in your class. 
And for every time you have a class, the draw of marbles that you get is going to be different. And some of those marbles are going to be highly motivated, and some of those marbles are going to be less motivated. And some of those marbles may have excellent work habits, and some of them may have less good work habits. But the, the particular draw that you get, you don't have control over necessarily. And I hear, my wife's on faculty, you hear faculty talking about this, right? I had a really good class this year. It was challenging this year, right, for the same class. So you're delivering, you know, your value added, you're delivering with excellence the same way, but that draw makes a difference in terms of how you're ultimately evaluated. So IDEA looked at that statistically and said, yes, it does make a difference whether the students are motivated. Yes, it does make a difference the individual work habits of the students. So what they did was create a regression formula that basically adjusted for the difference based up for the differences that they saw statistically in terms of the class size, in terms of student motivation, in terms of work habits. And so there's a formula applied that creates that. Okay? It's not, uh, it's not a one-to-one -one thing. You get a high score here and it goes down somewhere else. It actually, and they've published the regression formula. So folks who are statisticians and want to sit down and look at it, it's all there in a technical report. I'm happy to talk about it. But it's a, it's a complicated adjustment. The, the nice thing from a faculty perspective, from my perspective, is the administration has agreed to use ideas recommendations for whether, when we should use raw scores and when we should use adjusted scores. So... On our, same, um, on our same fact page that I showed you before, right, up here at the top there's a little thing that says, should I use the raw or the adjusted score? And there's a little flow chart. Okay? Basically, distilling this down into a simple summary, if your raw score is higher than adjusted score for the progress on relevant objectives, you should use the raw score throughout. So even if your score is going down on the adjustment, you should be using the raw score. And the reason for that is because the reason you have this adjustment made is so that faculty aren't penalized by teaching big classes or not having motivated students or not having students with good work habits. And so you want to be able to have that higher score. You want to be able to have that adjusted score that you can use when those circumstances apply. Okay? But if you are teaching a small class of 20 people with graduate students in the major, they are primed to do well. They are, they are, you know, they are going to achieve your learning objectives. They're going to do well. You're, the difference that can be made in terms of the effectiveness of your teaching styles and the things you do in the classroom is less for that group than a group of 200 of non-majors. Right? So you shouldn't be penalized for that. So in that case, with that, most of the cases, almost all the cases I've seen where you have a higher raw score, it's almost always those smaller classes. It's almost always more 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 level. Not always, right? You can use that raw score, but you can't pick and choose. You can't say, I've got a high raw score here, and I've got a high adjusted there, and I've got a high one here. The, the benchmark is you look at the progress on relevant objectives, and you basically say, did the students learn in the class? If they learned in the class, as long as you're in this range, you pick that, if the raw score is higher, then you use the raw score throughout. And if the adjusted score is higher, you use that throughout. Now, what we did to try to make this easier for faculty is we actually created a set of tools so that when you pull down course evaluation results, sorry, right, if I pull down if I pull down a set of course evaluation results here, the summaries that I get, this summary score here, is based on the higher of the raw or the adjusted. I have logic in the background here that's pulling that down. And we created actually a cumulative results. This is right on our website. You can go and it will it'll have you enter your, your A number and you can actually see a graph of all of your course results that we have in the IDEA database, right? So here's progress on relevant objectives. This is the excellent teacher score. This is excellent course. This is the summary evaluation. And you can print that out. And these scores here have selected either the raw or the adjusted, whichever is higher, right? And we designed this as a tool to try to make it easier for you to just be able to print something out. I can select PDF for printing. I can choose what, what I want my comparison group to, if I want to compare just to the disciplinary courses or the IDEA courses 
or I want to compare just to USU, I can do any of those. I can choose an individual course. And then it'll print out a PDF. that I could potentially throw in a P&T binder if I wanted to sell it, send it to an external committee with a set of notes at the bottom that explains exactly what it is that you're looking at, right? So that's a tool where there should be no confusion about whether you're supposed to be using the raw or the adjusted. This tool is helping do that. And so I can only tell you what the discussions that I've been party to at the administrative level, which is we've agreed that we're going to look at the progress on relevant objectives. And if the raw score is higher, then you should use the raw score. And if the adjusted score is higher, you should use the adjusted score. Right? This is a document that was produced by IDEA, not by my office. So... They've left it open because they want to enable the flexibility for any individual institution or unit to choose that, right? But we've already done this cut administratively. We've already discussed it at the level of the department heads and the deans, Chuck, at least a couple times, <laughs> right? So I don't think there should be confusion. And in fact, we've created tools online that remove the confusion. One of the reasons that we created this tool is so you can have the confidence, sorry, that you actually can print that out and use it. We presented this to the administration. They all agreed it was OK. Right? So if anybody, if you see numbers on here that you think are wrong or that don't match with your expectations, then come to my office by all means. But the expectation of, of creating this tool is so we can have consistency at the level of P&T committee, central administration, your department head. Right? And if there are problems with that, then I'm happy to be involved in those discussions because we've had a lot of those conversations over the last two and a half years. Yes? So you said pick either raw or adjusted. Can I pick either one by course? Does it have to be by semester? No, no, no. It's, it, it's, specific to, it's specific to your course result. It's specific to your results, right? So... so You should, right, you, you should, you I'm should. to make sure you're talking about unit of analysis as course. That course, right, that, that course, that semester, that one evaluation, yes. Okay. Correct. Yes. Thanks, thanks for asking. So the way it works with the faculty information form is you will get an email for every one of the sections that you teach. And the email is going to look like this. Right? So it'll say, please click on this link. When you click on the link, that takes you to another, it takes you to a web page. And you have an option at the bottom here to complete the faculty information form. You click on that and then complete the faculty information form. If you want to add some of your own customized questions to, for that class that semester, you click on the manage additional questions. And when you actually get through the faculty information form, it looks like this. 
the nice thing on our website, more shameless plugging, uh, on the faculty uh, frequently asked questions page, at the very top, there's a thing that says faculty information form instructions. Right. So, I understand all that, but I just received an email. Is that coming out? Yeah, so we can't load any of the classes. IDEA manages the emails and the whole process of setting up the courses. We can't load any of those until after day 15 when we have enrollments finalized. That stuff all happens later in the semester. So you'll, you won't get your email for a while. Okay. So after day 15 is two, a little bit more than two weeks into the semester, we give the departments two weeks to review their lists of classes to make sure nothing's wrong. The departments have responsibility for making sure that that list is complete, that, you know, that all the classes that are supposed to be there are there, that if this class isn't supposed to be evaluated, they take it out, right? So you're talking at least a month, at least four to six weeks into the semester before you're going to get an email asking you to fill out a faculty information form. Sorry. As I was choosing them, I was hoping I could actually choose something. You can, you can pull those objectives off oh, yeah, yeah, and, and set your syllabus up. In fact, you should now. And then when you get the faculty information form, you just pull out your syllabus and, and plug those in. I mean, yeah. one, if, if you really wanted to do it so that it was all, well, I mean, basically you'd be doing it twice. But there's a, a copy of the paper version of the faculty information form here at the bottom. If you click on that, you could actually print it out and Put your objectives in there if you wanted, and then pull it out when you have to when you get the email and just transcribe what it was that you did. But okay. All right. Thank you. yep. Okay. I'll show them the mapping. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, just over to yours. just a couple of things here uh, that I wanted to show related to the mapping. That's not this one. Uh, this one came off of off of the website, the AAA website. This is not from mine, but here's an idea of showing the students exactly where things are mapped. You have the idea center objectives, and I know that's the, you're not going to be able to read the, the, the actual print, uh, but we have the idea objectives on the left and then the specific learning outcomes uh, for the course, those building blocks. You can see how they're chunked there together, and students should be able to align those. Uh, the other thing, this was the one that I described. This is from my syllabus from a graduate level course that I taught last spring. I have the course description right out of the catalog. Uh, and then the course goals, if you notice, I picked the three uh, idea objectives. And maybe this wasn't the best thing to do. But you can see the language from those idea objectives, learning fundamental principles, generalizations of theories concerning, and then I have the, the, the course content, learning to apply a background in diffusion of innovations and course materials to improve. And that's where that. Uh, where those parentheses came into play. And so for me, that, that was the way of, of blending the two with my course goals with the, with the idea objectives. And the only suggestion that I've been making is that down at the bottom where you've got your assessment tools listed, mm -hmm. is go back to that other chart and make the third column and put them there. Yes, that would be helpful. That would be helpful. And I, I, I need to do that as the next step. Again, this is a this is me trying to wrap my head around this process, and it's taken me several years. I appreciate that uh, suggestion. This is off topic of the presentation, but more aligned with, with what we've done. I've shared this and, and kind of have a sort of blessing on it a little bit. Sure. Um, I wanted that table for the results, for, for my evaluation results and for those who I work with, uh, with uh, promotion and tenure, with tenure advisory committees. And so I took the old, the old table that I was given by our current provost uh, when I was going through the tenure and promotion process and made some adjustments to it. And uh, this is what I came up with. And we went back and forth several times with, with things. Uh, and so across the top is that summary, that overall summary. And this comes off of that Tableau, is that, am I saying that right? Yep. The Tableau results right off of the, of the AAA website. I go in there, I plug my information in, I pull up the Tableau results, and it gives me those numbers. I don't have to choose between the raw and adjusted. It's there. And the summary, I don't have to do any math. It's there. I pull those numbers in, and then I have where they fit in that chart, in the display. 
much higher, higher, similar, so on and so forth. And then I have them grouped by course, and that was the way the old system, that the old form that I used was so that we can see progress within a given course. And then I have out to the side, I, I have to pull, you have to pull these up three different times. You have to pull up the idea database, get those numbers, then pull up the discipline, get those numbers, then pull up the USU, and you can plug those numbers in out to the, to the right-hand side for each course. For me, looking at a, at, a, at a candidate for tenure and promotion or looking at my own results, I can see progress within courses. I can see, I, I have a, a snapshot view. I like the, the Tableau results uh, that Michael's office has done but I wanted it a little bit more in a table format. I actually have a, a paper copy. If any of you are interested, when we're finished, uh, come up and grab that, and, and you can see it. That's all I have. So, so more shameless plugging. Um, if you go to, um, if we go back to these course evaluation results, um, actually, sorry, if you go to these cumulative results that I showed you where we, we'd created a graph, I know lots of people like to control we, we, the idea wasn't to create some standardized format that everybody had to use. It was just trying to create something that would provide some consistency where people could point to it and say, I took the numbers right off the AAA site. If you have a problem with that, you go talk to Michael. <laughs> okay, so, but what one thing you have is one option here you'll notice on the side is there's a cross-tab Excel option. If I click on this, I get a downloaded Excel file that has the details of the course and the instructor and the response rate and the enrolled, and then it has your it has your scores here. So you that's what you could do that three times. You could do it once for comparing to the national database, once for comparing to the discipline, once for comparing just to USU, right? And then you could do your own graphs if you want to do your own table. Yes. On all these examples that he's just showing, um, are they using adjusted numbers or why? It depends on the course. I use that formula that this is, there's a formula in the background that's looking at what the score was on the progress on relevant objectives, and it's saying if the raw score was higher under progress of relevant objectives, use the raw score throughout for that instance of that class, right? Yeah, yeah. If, I got Yeah. Okay. So you, you get this, you go through there, but then from there into like the Excel spreadsheet that you showed. You would get 60, 55, 52, 54, and 57 for this specific class because the adjusted number is higher under progress of relevant objectives. The decision at USU was to use that flowchart and to say that unit expectations are meeting expectations. In other words, we expect that if you can demonstrate the students learned, so in other words, if the students' responses in terms of their progress uh, on the objectives that you selected is similar to national peers or higher than national peers or much higher, then the students are learning, so you should not be penalized if your raw score is higher. If the raw score is higher, you use the raw score throughout. So if this, if this was the highest score, then you'd use 58, 54, 49, 52, 55, okay? I'll give you an example. I taught uh, in one semester, I had a teaching methods course with 15 students, and then I had a life science class with 220 students. One of those courses, and I'll bet you can guess which one, the uh, raw score was higher than the adjusted. The other one, it was just the other way around on that progress for relevant objectives. And so then I followed that procedure in putting that into that table that I just showed you a few minutes ago. I stayed consistent. I picked one and then stayed consistent with all of those. And, and I guess what I'm trying to communicate is in the tools that we created, right, we've actually hard-coded that rule in so that if you pull up data using the tool I just showed you on the website and, and pull down this Excel file, it will have chosen either the raw or the adjusted for that class, for each class, depending on which one fit the, the rule. You bet. I think we're out of time. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody who wants to talk about these issues, you know, we, we really like talking about this in my office. I've had you know, conversations with individual faculty that I enjoy, you know, 
my goal in terms of the work of my office and the stuff we do, and I, I think people would mirror this, is, is we want the system to work. Uh, we want the best information we can get, and we want the system to work for folks. So anybody who feels like it's not working for them, please come see me. Thank you, guys. That was great. Thank you.